Constitution has been deleted too, and so have some other state symbols like a European anthem. And I wonder which of the 23 official languages were to be used to sing the European anthem in a football stadium. Another wordy document, the Charter of Fundamental Rights, disappeared in an annex, but it is nevertheless binding if an opt-out has not been expressed. Now, I notice that two groups still read a constitution between the lines, and strangely enough, both are the proponents and the opponents of the rejected constitution. Some politicians, mainly Belgian, Italian and French, still try to read a sort of constitution in it. In evenings they put the text under their pillow, hoping it will be a constitution the next morning. And at the same time, opponents in the constitution regard the current revised text as a constitution in disguise. They compare uh, and in details of the current text, they see the old creepy devil. But to me it is not a constitution anymore, neither in law nor in spirit. What is it then? It is a revised treaty, but it has cherry-picked elements from the constitution. These features are not new. They would also uh, have surfaced had there been no constitutional draft. The current treaty revision indeed, indeed proposes new elements, but they are less revolutionary than, for example, the Maastricht Treaty of 1991, which led the foundation for the euro and enlargement. Maastricht was the last really defining treaty, in fact. Now, let us look at these three questions which are behind me here. First of all, does it reconnect to people, the text? It certainly takes away the fear and anxiety about the nature of European integration. So it's no behemoth, no feral entity. Instead of a United States of Europe, it remains a Europe of United States. This idea reconnects, but the text of the treaty does not. It is not readable and not accessible. In fact, the Commission did not make a consolidated version. And as I heard and learned in the Commission uh, this week, it is done or not done on purpose, so people cannot read the text. It is very clever of the legal service to do this. So if you want to find out what the current text should be, you have to puzzle through the text and the pages, and it'll take you at least till Christmas to find out what it is all about. Now, according to some politicians, like Italian Minister of Domestic Affairs, Giulio Amato, the text is intentionally vague and ambiguous, aimed at fooling people and, for most, avoiding a referendum. And I find this reasoning ob obnoxious. I think a European treaty should be designed and formulated referendum-proof from the outset, because in the end, people should be given the opportunity to have a final say. Mr. Amato, the Italian minister, he works the other way around. He designs an eligible text to deceive people in order to prevent their final say. So now, no wonder that the corruption-ridden Italian political system once imploded. Now we come to the second question. Does the treaty streamline the institutional framework? It does to a certain extent, but in my view, not yet sufficiently. Most European institutions have become top-heavy as a result of enlargement. They have simply grown with enlargement. The College of Commissioners is now too big and it has to be sized down from 27 commissioners to about 18. I can tell you from my experience that a college of commissioners of 27 members is simply a kindergarten where commissioners talk, talk and the president decides. He, his conclusions are prepared before the meeting. He simply reads them out after discussion, after this discussion, whatever the nature of the discussion was. So basically, it's presidential rule. It has nothing to do with a debate. It's because the college is too big. If everybody has spoken for 10 minutes, the morning is over. And therefore, the president concludes. Now, the smaller commission will only come into force in 2014. I find this too late. It should be done in 2009 already. 
So another five years, we will have a big commission, top heavy, uh, too many members, and a lot of people not knowing what to do. And over the past years, the number of commission directorates general, DGs, departments, has also grown. It has grown to 35. Now why? The DGs had to be created or split in order to give a portfolio to each of the 27 commissioners. Because otherwise they had nothing to do. So you cannot imagine having a commissioner there without a portfolio. Because he'll sit in his office, he'll read the paper for the whole day, his cabinet has nothing to do, they will give interviews, and they will start complaining. So he needs to have something to do. That's why you have to create, for every commissioner, a, a portfolio, a, a DG. So at least he can be, or he can feel, like the boss. Now this uh, proliferation of DGs, of directors general, generals, has created coordination problems. And now there are many mandarins coordinating the coordinators. So a top-heavy commission also sparks all these 35 uh, directors general, with directors general, with a deputy director general, and so on. They spark a lot of turf war, and more than usual, at least more than, than, than necessary. And it leads to mandarins spending most of the time fighting each other. Now, policy making at the moment is being replaced by petty office politics because simply nobody knows what to do and how to do it. So the commission is a very difficult uh, legislative machinery at the moment because there are simply too many DGs fighting each other. Now if we look at the European Parliament, another important institution, it now consists of nearly 800 members. You nearly, nearly need a football stadium to get them all together. It's a lot. It's top full in Strasbourg. And it's difficult to steer such a big group into a decision-making process. Far too many members to assure proper parliamentary scrutiny. Um, a reduction was scheduled to 735 members of the European Parliament. But then member states could not agree on the number and they went up again to 751. So we are back to square one basically. And I find it still too big. I think we should have a European Parliament of 550 members. That would be manageable. A Parliament too big will become a kindergarten filled with hobby horses. Instead, a number of 550 is more or less the size of the American Congress. And now the European Parliament tends to become an unfocused talking shop, self-absorbing and self-serving. Too many, too many members of the European Parliament traveling around. If you meet on the airport a guy uh, with some travel gear and he is looking around where to go, it's a member of the European Parliament. Now, there are other committees as well. It's the Committee of the Regions, for example. They organize very good receptions with good wines. It's very nice to go there, but it's superfluous and it could be abolished. But it never delivered on its, prom it never delivered on its promises. But once an institution has been established in Brussels, it simply tends to stay, even when it is opaque. I remember that the West European Union was integrated into the EU and there was no need for its parliament anymore. But it had a parliament and the parliament continued meeting in, uh, in Paris, although the WEU wasn't there anymore. So it's very difficult to abolish institutions. Now, there are also many EU agencies. Far, there are about over 20 and they are spread all across Europe. Every, th every time an agency is established, there's a lot of fight between member states on where the, um, what the capital, what the, the seat of the agency is going to be. It's going to be Paris, Brussels, Warsaw, Helsinki, Rome, or whatever. There is a huge fight of it, uh, about it, and in the end, they are spread all over Europe. So, for example, the agency to protect the European border uh, is, uh, is seated in Warsaw. But there are no officials who want to go to, to Warsaw to live there. They'd rather have the agency in Rome, which is a better place to be. So they have trouble finding the right people to work in Warsaw. If you want to apply in Warsaw, 